This video is brought to you by CuriosityStream and Nebula. The Earth's atmosphere is complicated. Wind seems to blow in every direction, changing day by day and sometimes hour by hour. But there are regular, repeated winds. For example, the Atesian wind blows every summer in the Aegean Sea, and the Mistral in southern France every winter. But the most regular, fixed part of the atmospheric circulation is the trade winds, a band of fast moving air moving from east to west near the equator all year long. These winds have had a huge influence on human history, enabling intercontinental travel for centuries before aircraft. But what causes them, and how do they form? The first step in our modern understanding of the trade winds lies behind me at the Royal Society in London, within a very particular map. But before looking at that map, I need to introduce you to a very important person. Not Keith, the head librarian at the Royal Society, though he is important too, but this guy. This is one of my favourite Royal Society scientists, this is Edmund Halley. For most people, Halley is the name they associate with the comet, but what were the other sort of big contributions to science that, that he made? It's actually quite difficult to, to enumerate them all because there were so many. You can see here his model of the interior of the Earth, so he was a bit of an Earth scientist. He was a sea captain. Uh, he produced a diving suit that he wore and demonstrated. He also predicts the transit of Venus, and that's why people like Captain Cook go off to, to make observations at Cook's uh, case in Tahiti. So uh, Halley is a, is a big figure. Just a few accomplishments. Halley has an amazing place in the history of physics. He is responsible for the publication of possibly the most significant scientific work of all time, Newton's Principia, paying for its publication after the Royal Society spent all of its money on an admittedly lovely volume on the history of fish. But Halley was not just an enabler, he did amazing science himself. In particular, he was interested in the trade winds, being so important to trade across the Atlantic and Indian oceans. And that interest culminated in the map that I came here to see. So here we have the Philosophical Transactions in 1686, so just a few years later. So this is the, uh, the, the headline paper, that the, the journal that the Royal Society produces. That's right. So Philosophical Transactions is our major journal, still being produced. It's the world's uh, oldest uh, properly scientific journal. Uh, and you can see as a frontispiece to this particular issue, there's this rather wonderful and quite large map, a map of the world and you can see wind directions marked. To help the conception of the reader in a matter of so much difficulty, I believe it necessary to adjoin a scheme showing at one view all the various tracks and courses of these winds, whereby it is possible the thing may be better understood than by any verbal description whatsoever. It's very scientific, you give a figure. As, as somebody who has studied the atmosphere for so long, this is, it's a really foundational text. This. Mm. this is a really key moment in the history of the atmosphere. And, and it's interesting, he, he, he goes worldwide as far as he could. So yes. He talks about the southern, Great Southern Ocean as well and um, the various parts where uh, traders would go. So you've got Arabia, Persia, India. But this is, yes, yeah, so this is um, effectively one of the first papers in what we would now call climatology. So, yeah. so this is a global view of the atmospheric system. and. It's only when you look at it at this global scale that you identify these patterns that are being caused by planetary scale phenomena. So how did Halley construct this map? Where did he get the data from? Um, obviously he couldn't travel to all of these places himself. <laughs> he gave it a good go. <laughs> he, he, he did. He, he managed to get quite, quite far afield in, in uh, the Atlantic, uh, what he calls the Ethiopic Ocean here. But he uh, could gather uh, existing written reports and he could uh, solicit information from people. The Ross Society was very good at sending lists out of things they wanted to know from mm. far-flung places, and they would get replies back. And of course, uh, naval captains and merchants would also be able to supply information. It's surprising how far people got at this period. I mean, we, we do tend to think of the world as, as quite limited in the 17th century, but they were trading as, as far away as, as uh, uh, Korea, uh, China and Japan at that period. But it wasn't uh, a sort of Humboldtian idea of going out to take data. This was, you're going along this way and we'd like you to take some measurements for us. So, so if, if they knew an ambassador that was going overseas, if they knew a sea captain or a trader, uh, they, they could solicit information that way. And an awful lot of this, 
is, is information that has come from activities that, you know, they're effectively efforts at colonisation or proto-colonisation. Well, that's right. I mean, you mentioned the trade winds uh, uh, and trade with the Americas. Of course, this, this is exactly the period when uh, the slave trade is beginning. And the, the trade winds form one part of the triangle from Africa exactly to the, right. to the Americas. Exactly right, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this, is, this map is a milestone in atmospheric history and it is amazing to touch it, but it does have that debt to a really horrible part of human history. Absolutely right, yes. Halley believed that the trade winds were caused by the warmth of the sun pushing air masses in front of it, consistently from east to west. There is, however, a very obvious problem with this explanation. The trade winds are localised to a narrow band of latitudes near the equator, while Halley's theory implies that they should exist from pole to pole. Halley was aware of this problem, and so he implored others to take up the task of explaining the trade winds. Eventually, his call was answered by, of all things, a lawyer, also connected to the Royal Society. Even at this, this period, you, no one earned their living as a scientist, really. Well, the term didn't even exist. Exactly right. So you might well be a lawyer or, or a, a trader of some kind, a merchant. Uh, you might be a physician or an aristocrat, and you would do science as, as a kind of a, not quite a hobby, but a, a, it wasn't your way of earning a living. You were a gentleman scholar as you part were. of your other activities. That's right. It, and it's amazing how, uh, how neat this is. It, it's, it's what, what one, two, three, four, four and a half pages, uh, half of which is sort of a very pleasant greeting, really, to the problem. And it's, it's just a verbal explanation. In stark contrast to what Halley did, you know, using a visual aid, yeah. uh, what, what in a modern paper you would absolutely have a diagram. Yes, so uh, this is later, this is, we're into the 1730s, now into the 18th century, and uh, this is George Hadley's paper concerning the cause of the trade winds, which you're now going to explain to me. <laughs> well, seeing as you are so nicely, Keith. Handley considered what happens when air moves towards the equator, towards the area of low pressure that rings the Earth. As it moves towards the equator, from both north and south, air is deflected westwards. Hadley reasoned that this happened in order to conserve the air's linear momentum. By increasing its distance from the Earth's axis, it must decelerate. But this deceleration acts in the opposite direction to the Earth's rotation, and so is perceived by someone at the surface as an acceleration in a westward direction. I know it's a bit mind melty, this idea took a long time to catch on. We now think of the trade winds as the return flow of a huge three-dimensional circulation that we call the general circulation. Air rises over the warm equator, moves polewards both north and south, and then eventually starts to sink again. However, by rising over the equator, it left behind an area of low pressure, which sucks the air back in before rising once more, closing the loop. After Hadley, we call this circulation the Hadley cell. But as it turns out, Hadley was only nearly correct in his explanation, as there's an extra kind of momentum to consider when explaining the trade winds, as derived by Coriolis. To find out more about that, you'll just have to read or listen to my book, Firmament, an introduction to atmospheric science, out now, linked in the description. So what we've seen here is two scientists who have been very tied to the Royal Society and have used that their connection to this nexus of information to form these events. What is the role of the Royal Society in, history, in scientific history at this time? Is this a very common thing that we're seeing across lots of sciences? Yeah, so um, learned societies have a network of scholars attached to them. So this is the fellowship. You know, the, the Royal Society isn't really a, a place or a building. It's a, it's a collective of scientists. And at this period, they would correspond, not just with the Royal Society, but uh, between Each themselves. Other, That's right. Letters. Exactly right. Uh, and this is how ideas got propagated. It's how information was gathered. So um, organizations like the Royal Society, which encouraged this kind of activity were very important indeed. 
Halley, as well as being an amazing scientist, was also for a time a sea captain. He undertook voyages throughout the Atlantic, including the first purely scientific voyage ever by an English vessel. This all took place during the 17th century, a time when Europe extended its influence around the world, partly enabled by the trade winds Halley described. To understand the modern world, you need to understand the history of this time, a story laid out in Ambitions and Conquests, part of the Story of Europe series with Dr. Christopher Clark. Nice name. Available on Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is the home of thousands of professionally produced documentaries, perfect to pop on while you're eating dinner and learn something new. You can get access at my link, curiositystream.com slash Simon Clark, and get 26% off a subscription. But more than that, you also get access to Nebula. If Curiosity Stream is the home of big budget professional documentaries, Nebula is the home of indie educational content, owned and operated by a large number of independent educational content creators. Here there are no ads, there's no algorithm, and there's plenty of exclusive content, such as Wendover's recent documentary on the Colorado River or Real Life Laws series on modern conflicts. Nebula is our alternative to YouTube that pushes the boundaries of what educational video online can achieve. To support my work and get access to CuriosityStream and Nebula, head to curiositystream.com slash Simon Clark. I promise you, you won't regret it. With thanks to CuriosityStream and Nebula for sponsoring this video. Thank you so much for watching the video all the way through to the end. Thanks must also go to Keith, who was just phenomenal in helping me in this video. I had a fantastic time filming in the Raw Society with him. Fingers crossed I get to do some more filming with him in the future. If you'd like some recommended viewing next, there's some suggestions up on the screen. And if you're not already, then please do subscribe to the channel so you can be notified when I make more videos like this one. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.